We have a very good crowd here this morning. We're certainly glad to see you. If you're uh, out there in your, your car this morning, you're certainly welcome. We're, we're glad that we have the ability to still broadcast that over the radio for those that would like to stay out there. First song is 296. 296. All right, let's sing. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him. Forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him. just a few announcements then we'll continue with our morning worship service again if you're out in your car this morning you can uh, tune in to 107.1 and uh, still receive that if you uh, do not have the items you need for the Lord's Supper make sure that you let us know that by a honk of the horn uh, also if you've not gotten yours we'll still not be passing that around so those are out in the foyer so pick those up as you uh, as you come in please this evening we will have our singing night at 6 o'clock, so remember that. It is our third Sunday and we'll have singing night. So remember, make your plans to be a part of that. Also, if you have any fathers out there, we certainly want to wish all of our fathers a happy Father's Day. I want to uh, remember you. As, as we say on Mother's Day, we wouldn't be here without you. Uh, we want to remember all of those that we have on our prayer list. We have those that uh, we need to remember. We want to continue to remember Gloria Carter as well as uh, Juanita Gray. Uh, so remember those and all the others that you see here on the list, if you would, in your prayers, please. If we've overlooked something, let us know. We'll make sure that gets announced for you. Thank you. Our next song, 611, Walking in Sunlight, 611. Right, we're going to sing verses 1 and 3, and let's sing. Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains. Through the deep veil, Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee. Promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Yeah. 
Before we have our scripture reading and our opening prayer this morning, we'll sing 613, 613, Hold to God's Unchanging Hand. Amen. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. Time is filled with swift transition. Not a earth and blood can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. chapter 6 verse 8 he has shown you O man what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God let's go to God in prayer please our Father God in heaven held to be thy name throughout heaven and earth Father we truly thank you so much for your, uh, allowing us to be your children for providing that provision through your son for us to be your children children of God. Father, we thank you so much for sending your son, for his willingness to come here, for, for just all that he taught and all that he still teaches even today. We pray, Father, that we will listen to what he has to say, which is what you have to say, and take it into our hearts, especially this morning as it is preached to us. We pray for the one that is about to speak your word to us, that he has full recollection of what he has studied and that we will give him full attention. Father, we thank you so much for the blessings of this land and the part of the land that we're in, we thank you for. Thank you for keeping us safe. And thank you for protecting us and for answering our prayers and for the avenue of prayer, which we truly believe in and we know that you hear. And not only hear, but we know that you answer also. Father, we thank you so much for just all the things we can't even count, there's so many things. But you know our needs, and you see to them, and we thank you for that. Thank you, Father, for, for this facility, which makes it so easy to come here and comfortable to worship you, the one and only living God. And as we remember your son this morning, we pray, Father, that you will be pleased with how we do it, and that we are following his commands, which are yours. Father, be with us now as we enter into this worship service to you. For we pray in his name, Jesus the Christ, amen. As we prepare our minds for taking the Lord's Supper, we'll sing 383. 383. Jesus, keep me near the cross. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. Sing. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fountain. Till my 
As we prepare our minds to protect the Lord's Supper, I'd like to read from Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 14. And it reads, When the hour had come, he sat down with the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Let's give thanks for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread. To us as Christians, serves as your son's body that hung on the cross for our sins. We pray that we would take of it in a matter and pleasing into you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give thanks for the cup. Likewise, Father, we thank you for this cup, the fruit of the vine. To us as Christians, serve as your son's blood who hung on the cross for our sins. We pray that we partake of it in a matter and pleasing into you. In Jesus' name, amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. We'll give you an opportunity to give the offering after service. We'll have a basket out there for you. Let's go ahead and offer a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and our many blessings. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to be here, Father. We thank you for our homes and our jobs, Father, and we pray that we give back with a cheerful heart, and we pray that this helps spread your word locally and throughout the world. And it's in Jesus' name, amen. Next song is 634. 634. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. 634. Oh, land of rest. Yeah. 
Mark your bush, you can do that at page 904. Page 904 will be your invitation song. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of that song at that time. Song before we have our lesson this morning, 587. 587. Sing and be happy. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. If you'd like, you may stand as we sing. Sunday morning and happy Father's Day. It's really a, a great day to be able to share together and to uh, encourage parents and uh, this morning is kind of what we want to do and I want to talk to you about qualities of a good father. I, I know I was blessed uh, in my early years my dad's a little rough but you know as I got a little older he became a Christian and was just a hard worker in the kingdom of God set such a good example for us and uh, he had one thing to say though he, he had written in one of his Bibles he said I wish I'd have started sooner. And I guess we could all say that, wouldn't we? We could all say we wish we'd started sooner. We wish we'd have done a better job. I, and I'm dressed a little bit differently this morning. This shirt I've got on is the shirt that my son gave me. Uh, you know, and he was a great father and did a lot of great things with his kids. And I was thinking about the company that he worked for. They loved him. And, uh, of course, they wanted to move to uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, he just wasn't, couldn't do it. But he worked through online. And... Uh, but he was just really, uh, you know, and they loved him, and they set up a day when he passed away. Apparently, he had, they'd set a day, and it was Nate Kirby Day, and they, they went out in the community and did good deeds because they said that's what he was about. And uh, he was about that as a father, and, and he just loved his kids and did a great job with them and uh, what time he had. And, uh, you know, you, as you look back as a father, you think of, t of things that you did. Maybe it's, uh, you know, sometimes you did the right thing, sometimes you didn't. You just you just try to do the best you can and, and lead and guide your kids and, you know, and uh, you know, you see the the results, and uh, sometimes you see the failures. You know, you see things that you know you, maybe you could have done a little better. And uh, but you know, parents, fathers, you know, we're not perfect. Nobody is, and it wasn't but one perfect, and that was Jesus, and they killed him. And but I, I was thinking about what what would be some of the things that would be good as a father. What what would help us? What would uh, encourage us to as families? You know, because really, church is about family, and we are the most important family. We are the church of Jesus Christ. 
We are the family of God. And we got to love each other. And, you know, a lot of people in this world, they don't have good fathers. You know, there's they're maybe for one reason or another. I, I know uh, talk to different people occasionally, and they just really, their, their dads weren't what they ought to be. And I was thinking about a man in particular in, in Dunlap, Tennessee. His name was Robert, and Robert was re really a great guy. But, you know, he grew up in a rough situation. But, his, but you know, he always said that when I talk about Father's Day and honoring your father and mother, he says it's really hard to honor my father. And I said, well... You know, sometimes we honor people because of their position, not necessarily because we agree with what, everything they do. And uh, sometimes that's hard to do, but I think it's really true. And, of course, that's in government. You know, you honor your government even though you don't agree with everything they do and, and pray for them. And, but, uh, you know, you, you think about uh, the, the Bible in Michael 6, 8. I, I like what it says. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of thee, but to be do justly, love, and mercy, and walk humbly before God. You know, what a philosophy. You know, if we if we we want to be men and women of God, and and we want to walk before God, we want to honor God with our lives. Uh, we want to follow Him, and, and you know, this to me, he, he says He's shown you. God has shown it. How did He? He's shown it in in the death of His Son. He's shown it in His creation. He's just shown us in all these different ways, and He, he shows us what is good, and you know, and, and He shows what does the Lord require? What does He want us to do? And, you know, and we, we have the New Testament to follow and to live by. And, and you know, but he, he says, but really here, he says, to require of thee, but to do justly, you know, and to try to live a just life. So, you know, sometimes that's difficult because of the challenges that we face and, and temptations of all kinds that come our way. But nonetheless, he says to live justly. You know, are we living justly before God? And, you know, that he's the most important judge. And, you know, he's one that will judge righteously. And there's no doubt in his mind where we stand. And he knows this morning where we're at. And what we stand for and what we are and you know and, and, and being ready to meet him but to do just love and mercy you know to have love and and care for each other and of course a father's role is you know uh, ultimately to love his children and love them and, and help them and, and we'll look at that in just a minute but you know to, to show mercy you know sometimes we don't show mercy like we need to and to walk humbly there's no pride or arrogance in living for jesus folks when Jesus came and lived on this earth, he humbly walked and he humbly served and ministered. He, he came and he was king of kings and lord of lords and yet he washed his disciples' feet. That's the kind of person that Jesus was. And that's the kind of person I want to be and I know that's what you want to be. That's the kind of people that we want to be as God's family and, and to see that. But here are these qualities. And, you know, but what, what is one of the qualities? Godly father loves God. You know, I was thinking about uh, when Jesus was asked about the greatest command. What is the greatest commandment? And, you know, if we look at all the commandments throughout the Bible and, and you think about a godly father loves God with all his heart, with all his mind, with all his strength. And, you know, with his, his whole being is what that's saying. And, and, you know, that's true of all of us. Man or woman, mother or father, you know, or just individuals. You know, to love God with everything and to keep the kingdom of God at top priority in our lives. You see, that's what happens to us. This world, will, it'll draw you in and it'll pull you away in every way that it can. But God, you know, here, He, he wants us to seek the kingdom of God. He wants us to, to, to strive to, to serve Him. And, and, you know, I always thought if you could just love God with all your being, everything else would just fall into place. Everything else would just be there and, and we, could, we could just do it because we love God and God is number one and, and, and we love Him and we keep His commandments. We do the things that He says and, and, and in following Him and a father, you know, you're, you're thinking about kids that follow you, you know, your children follow you and you say, well, I'm not a father, but there's kids around us in, in church in different places and family and, and they're looking for somebody. Some of them don't have a role model. A few years ago, there was a school that decided, you know, the kids were getting more and more rambunctious, and they started putting fathers in the hallways. And they, would just, they were just there. They would stand out there, and they'd talk to the kids and visit with the kids, and, and the majority of the kids loved them and, and grew to appreciate them. And, and it really helped change the atmosphere of that school. And so, you know, they, but the father's role, you know, you think about it. If, if he loves God, you know, the kids are going to fall into place. They're going to they're going to see that and they're going to say, hey, they know you. And of course, no one knows you better than your kids. No one knows you because they, they've been looking at you. They've been seeing you and they know what you believe and they know what, what you're practicing. And they they know if you're a do as I say, not as I kind of do kind of guy. See, I don't be that guy. I don't be the guy that sets the pace, that lives the life. You know, one of these days as they look back on our lives and they say, you know, I, I had a father that loved God. He's, God was the most important thing in his life and, you know, and, and he, he meant so much to me and, and he made God mean so much to me because that's what my parents stood for. That's what they believed in. 
And they didn't let anything get in the way of that. And sometimes that's hard to do because of the world in which we live. But, and then a godly father loves his wife. Don't you all think that's important? He's got to love his wife. In the book of Ephesians, when it talks about husbands and wives and how important that role is, wives submit to your own husbands as the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church. He is Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be their own husband in everything. Husbands, now listen to this. Husbands, love your wife. You, you think that's important. To have that kind of love, to love your wife. You know, a lot of problems in the world today are in, in families is because they had a role model that didn't show that love and a father that didn't lead that family. And so, therefore, it, it ended up in chaos. But you got to love your wife. And you qualify that by saying, he says, love your wives. How are you to do that? He says, as Christ loved the church. You know, you don't know how much you love your wife till she's gone. How much she did for you, how much you appreciate her until that, that separation takes place in death. And, and some of you have had to live that. And it's not easy, but you live it and you, you keep going. But, uh, but a godly father, a godly man, he loves his wife and, and not just with lip service. You know, it's easy to just say that and it's easy to say I love you, but, but when he shows it in his actions, a godly father loves his wife as Christ Love the church. How much did he love the church? It says he gave himself up. Can you imagine a man being willing to, that loved a woman so much? He, he'd give himself for her. He'd lay down his life for her. You know, there's not a lot of, a lot of relationships that people would do that. And Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, and to lay down his life for his friends. Well, you know, if your wife's your friend, you're going to you be willing to do that. You're going to lay down your life. And, you know, sometimes you think about, we, when we say that, we think about dying. You know, we think about, well, somebody's going to die. Well, really, to lay down your life in living. You know, to lay down your life in, in doing. And lay down your life in action to love your spouse. To love them with all your heart. It, it's so important. And here we see that, you know, Christ said, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And, and what did he, he gave himself up for it. And so the sacrifice is there, and that's what relationship is about. It's about sacrifice. It's about loving. It's about getting through those hard times, those difficult times when it's not easy. And, and the husband plays a major role in it, but he says he loved Christ, loved the church, gave himself up that he might sanctify and cleanse it by washing of water and the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, but to, that he should be whole, she should be holy and without blemish. He says, so husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. A godly father loves his wife. A godly father sets an example. The son can look and say, hey, that's how I want to treat my wife. That's how I want, I want my son to treat his wife. And see, so he's setting an example so that others can see it and know that this is, this is the way it is. This is the way it has to be. This is what God commanded. But you don't have to, it's not a command that you, you just do it. You, know, you, just, you just know that's your responsibility. You know that you love them and that you care for them. And a godly father, what does he do? He, he, loves his, he loves his wife. Ephesians 5 makes it so clear and he, he just shows it. He says husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. You love your wife, you love yourself. You know what? She's part of yourself. She's part of your being. I always thought it was unique. I've run into a lot of people over time. Don and Betty, you just celebrated 51 years. That's awesome. You know, if anything needs to be praised and honored, a man and woman that stays together 51 years, that's awesome. But I, I was just thinking about how, you know, so many people, it's so odd now for people to make it that far. They just don't have that commitment. They, something about it's changed. Nothing's changed in the Word of God, but nonetheless, it, here, he, he makes it clear. He, he says, you, you love your wife as your own body, and he who loves his wife loves himself. He said, you don't really realize that, how much you love yourself but you learn it through your wife and here he makes it clear that that's part of it but a man he says for this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh and that goes he takes them all the way back to Genesis and there it is in the beginning and when God had created all the animals and here they are all of them animals and, and Adam gave the names of the animals I don't know how all that happened but I know he says he named them and then he, he Lord knows some he says it was not good that man should be alone and it's not good. Tough to be alone, isn't it? It really is. But I was thinking about when Adam, you know, God put him to sleep and pulled that rib out of his side and he created that woman and, 
you know, God took some special pains with that woman. I mean, you think he created all that and then created a man and then he, cre he creates this woman out of her, her side. And, and these words that are written here come from the Old Testament in Genesis. And it says, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And they say that this is really hard to interpret. It's really hard to get the full meaning out of that. But really what is just simple, simple ter term is ooh la la. You know, I mean, he saw this beautiful creature coming and, you know, he'd never seen anything like it before because it was woman. It was the wife, and, and he, he declared them husband and wife, and, and of course, Adam knew his wife, and they conceived and had children, and he says, this is a great mystery I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. You know, one thing I think about, a, a man who loves his wife as Christ loves the church, her wife, his wife don't have any problem showing respect, because she's willing to sacrifice and give, and you know, but on, on this day, as we're thinking about this, you know, here, this, and then I think about 1 Corinthians 13. I can't help but to think about this passage, because it really deals with our relationships with one another. But a godly father has this kind of uh, relationship. He says, I, though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a changeling symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and ha I have all faith that I should remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. You know, love is so important in our relationships. It's important for a, a young man, a, a boy, to, to see how his father treats his wife and how he loves her and, and shows her respect. And he makes it clear here, he says that, he says, if I have all faith and remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. You know, you think, having that great of faith. And he said, but you do that and you don't have love. It's nothing. He says, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. You see, this is the kind of love that we have to have in our relationships. Our, our young children need to see this kind of love in our family and, and see it grow. But love suffers long and is kind. Love it does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own, does not provoke, does not think evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. You see, a godly father knows that. He knows that loving God is number one. He's seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he loves his wife. Is that important in the family? You better believe it. Because how he treats his wife is how their children are going to treat their, their mates. And so loving, uh, having a godly father that loves, and then lastly, we look at this, a godly father loves his children. You know, I got two that I raised, and I know they sometimes get aggravated me, and I might get aggravated to them once in a while, you reckon? It kind of happens that way, doesn't it? Anytime you put two people in the same household, you're gonna, sometimes you're going to have a little difficulty. But I was thinking about this passage, and in American tradition, for years, the man went out, he was the breadwinner, and he, he needs to be, and the, guess who raised the children? Well, the dad, uh, the mother. Mother always raised the children. She was the one. She took. She he was the breadwinner. He might work sun up, sun down, and and come home, and go to bed. But mama was the bread. Mama was. The, she's the hub, and she still is. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that's not true. But here he he says something that really kind of goes countercultural to us. It's really different when you start thinking about it. And and he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Young people, did you hear that? You want me to read it again? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It's right for you to obey your parents. Sometimes you may not want to. Sometimes you don't understand it. Or you sometimes you can't figure out why they say what they say or why they say no and don't want to let you do something. It's just common practice to do that. And, but here he, he says, obey them. And obeying them, he says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Now notice, he, here is a, it's interesting that he says this, and you start looking at this. He says, this is the first commandment with promise. What is the promise? Well, he says, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. Well, now, for a long time, I didn't know how long I was going to live, because I, I sometimes wasn't as good as I, a child as I ought to be. But he says that the first commandment with promise, children, obey your parents the Lord, honor your father and mother, the first commandment with promise, that you may live long on the earth. 
So see, there's hope for you if you'll, if you'll obey your parents. If you'll do what they ask you to do and follow what they ask you to do. But, but it is interesting in this next part, really what we want to look at, uh, it, it talks about what a father's role is in the family. And, uh, you know, he says, it says, fathers bring them up. Now, really, you start thinking about it, really, we, we've not, as a culture, pretty much we've said that's mama's job. She's taking care of the kids. I'm bringing in the bacon. I'm, I'm bringing home the, the money. And, you know, but here he, he really, and I like Proverbs 31 because Proverbs 31 talks about the virtuous woman and, her, you know, her price is far above rubies. And then it talks about she sowed, she sold, she bought, she made it, she helped, she helped the household. And, you know, she played a major role in not only the children and her children, it says, rise up and call her blessed. But here he tells us, fathers, he says, provoke not your children to wrath, but do what? Bring them up. I'm not sure the exact count of homes that have, do not have fathers, but it's way up there. A lot of homes don't have fathers anymore. Divorce has destroyed a lot of it. Sometimes just life in general but it says fathers do that fathers bring them up you play an active role in helping your children to grow and develop and to become what they need to become and you know it's, he's very clear about it he, he, he makes no bones about it and he says you honor your father and mother and then he says uh, basically that he says fathers don't provoke your children wrath. And I think sometimes we might, uh, some verses say aspirate, or we get them upset over things that, you know, maybe pushing them too hard. But here, he, and we look at this, and we think about this, it's not talking about abuse. You know, a lot of children live in homes of abuse, and they're, uh, you know, they're going, having things that are not right happen to them in their homes. And it's really sad, but here, he says, bring, fathers, bring them up. He said, mothers bring them up. Now, but does mother play a major role? Sure, she does. But the father is that role model, that example. And he says, bring, fathers, bring them up. And you think about it, where is fathers in modern day family? The sad thing is, you turn on TV, many times fathers are looked at as a joke, laughed at and made fun of and, and ridiculed. And yet God's word elevates the father. He wants him to take the role. He wants him to take the lead. And he says, bring them up. Well, what does that mean? That means training. You know, I, I know a lot about training. When I spent six years in the Air Force, when the first thing they started doing, they started training me to do things that I had never dreamed it would be part of. I, you know, you think military, you're going to carry guns, shoot guns. They taught me how to fold my socks. They think, how do you, why would you want to learn me to teach me to fold my socks? I, of all things, you want me to fold my socks and my underwear and all that and get it all, and it has to be just right in that drawer, and you got to have everything hanging up just like it's supposed to be. And what they were doing, they broke us down, and then they started building us back up. And it was all, if you take care of the little things, and that, this is what I try to emphasize to kids, I, you know, take care of the little things. You know, if you open that drawer, close it, or if you, uh, you th something falls on the floor, pick it up. You know, the little things are what's going to make the big difference. And when I was in the military, I didn't really understand that until I got in the military and I started saying that the reason they're doing that is because they want me to be able to, to, to when I'm in the field, to do the little things. So that it might, somebody's life might depend on that little thing, me doing that right thing and doing it right. And, and, and you know, these guys, when they come in and see your life, it wasn't just right. They'd turn it over and say, start over. I mean, they would literally flip this big old locker over in the floor, make you pick it up, and then start over. They'd take your bed and flip it over because if you didn't do it right, and all they were doing, it was a game. They were training us to help us to be out there when we got out there that we would be able to know what to do. And we would take the little things seriously because they were going to make a difference, but they were training us. One of the hardest things to do sometimes is to train your young people. But we do that. We want to do that. And we want them to train. We want them to develop. We want them to grow. Training is part of it. And, and all of us, this, this, it's a church thing. It's a family thing for us that we train our children and, and our classes and, our, and, the, and the way we handle things and the way we deal with each other. And all of that's training. It's preparing them. Because guess what? One of these days, our space will be empty and somebody else hopefully will fill it. One of the most scary things to me in the church today is all these white heads. And I don't have anything against white heads, don't get me wrong. But I'm going to tell you, we need to fill the pews with young people. We need to fill the pews with young adults, young families. 
because you know there's so many places now everywhere I go I start to see less and less young people and the, the gray is growing and they're getting older what's happened what happens to the church when the when the grays are gone we know the church will be gone training young people that's what Bible class is about. It's about training young people to know the truth so the truth can set them free. And training is a major part of that. And then it talks about admonition. You know, encouraging young people. You know, that's one of the things that is so important because, you know, I mean, there's a lot of them that get out there and they do a lot of things wrong, but don't, don't classify all of them that way. Not everybody's bad. Not all these young people. There, there are so many more good young people. But admonishing them and encouraging them is so important. And the Father's role is to do that. And really, sometimes we may not realize, but whatever we, picture we see of them and it, however we perceive them, you know, if we perceive them as sorry and no account, guess what? They, they may become what we think they are. And they will become what they think they are, what, they, what we think they are, if we, we will train them and admonish them and encourage them. Because a lot of young people, when they, they go to church when they're growing up and they, they fill the pews and then when they get out, they go somewhere else. They, they just get away from them. Maybe because we didn't train them well enough. We didn't help them to see the truth so that they could hold on to it. So godly fathers, rise to the occasion. Now, maybe your kids are growing and gone. You can still be a godly influence on people's lives. And all of us can be a godly influence. And we need to do that. We need to continue to set that example and be that kind of people. Godly fathers are, are, are so important to our congregation. That's where our elders are coming from. And that's where our deacons are coming from. And that's, that's the hope of the future for the church. But you see, being that example... Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. You know, I, I don't think Paul did everything 100% right. I know he didn't because he makes that statement in a couple places. But he says, follow me as I follow Christ. You know, if your parents, none of them are perfect, and if they, if they weren't what they needed to be, that's okay. You, you can't change it. But you see, when we, I feel, always felt like when we reach a certain age, it's not their fault. We have, we're accountable. We reach the age of accountability. And I think when you, you're looking more when you get out of your home, you know, a lot of people want to look back and say, well, them parents I had, they just didn't teach me right, or they didn't do this, or they didn't, you know. When you're 18 and you, 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 you reach adulthood or when, whatever age that is, you are responsible. And it's in your court. You have the ability to do, to be, be able to accomplish, and to do great things no matter where you came from. And you see, the beautiful thing is, God, He's not so concerned with where you've been. He wants to know where you're going. What are you going to do? How are you going to live? How are you going to impact the world? You see, a lot of that falls on us as fathers to be what we can be, to live what we need to live, to be that example to young people, especially the ones that live under our roof. We don't want to fall short of that. We don't want to lose sight of that. We just want to live for Jesus. And this morning, I hope you're living for Jesus. I hope you're, you're living a life and setting that example, being that kind of father and mother, being an example. Or if you came from a home that maybe didn't have that, you think, hey, it's all right. I mean, you can't change it. You can't change where you've been, but you can change where you're going, what you're doing, the way you're living. You see, it's up to you. You reach a point where it's your choice, it's your responsibility, and, and come judgment day, guess what? The Bible makes it very clear. He says every person will give an account of what they've done in this life whether it be good or whether it be evil and you can't say well you know that church I went to they didn't no you can't say or that preacher that you, you had preaching but they, he didn't no you can't do that you see because it's between you and God it's your relationship how's your relationship with God this morning I hope it's good I hope you're setting an example I hope you're living the life and letting that light shine because there's a lot of people looking you don't know how much they're looking until you, you know, things happen and you have to deal with stuff. And people, you know, they're looking and say, ah, now, yeah, you, you, everything's good. You, you're doing okay. As long as it's going good, it's no problem. But when it gets tough, you see, that's when the people see. That's when they see the light shining. When darkness is all around you and you keep living for Jesus. I hope you're living for Jesus this morning. I hope you're being that example. Exam being an example is really important. But you know what? who's watching? Those people are watching. Our young people are watching. But you know what? God is watching. 
I think it was Anthony Wednesday night, we sang that song, There's an Eye Watching You. That song used to scare me to death. <laughs> All I could think about is, he's watching me. <laughs> but you know, really, he is, but for good and bad. He's, he's watching no matter what we do. And the thing about it is, we won't give an account. I hope you're ready to do that. If you're not a Christian this morning, what a great day to put Christ on in baptism, to have your sins washed away. You can rise and walk in newness of life. Get a second chance, start over, begin that new life. If you've done that and maybe you've not been the example you need to be, you've not followed Christ, maybe your, your love for Him has wavered and you'd like for us to pray with you and for you and you can ask God to forgive you and we'll pray for you. And We're here for that. We're here to encourage each other. But our families are important, folks. And there's a war going on for our, for our children. I guess there's a war going on for all of us. And we don't want Satan to win. We want to win. We want the battle to be fought. We want to fight it hard. And one of these days we'll hear those words that Paul said, I fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I've kept the faith. I hope you can say that this morning. But if we can help you in any way and you need to respond, I'll encourage you to come as we stand and sing.